What is up everybody? This is part two of a correlation video series on why correlations are so important. If you've not watched part one on correlations or this video, none of this will make sense because I'm going to pick up from that point forward and show you another correlation video example from the same day as that trading session, which took place on August 3rd, 2023. You're about to see some more correlated trades on August 3rd, 2023, later in the session. So we're going to pick up from there and talk about correlations. I'm not going to explain why I use them and why they're so good. So if you didn't watch that video, you need to go watch it. Otherwise, this will make absolutely no sense. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. First and foremost, I'm going to make myself disappear and just give you a little bit of context. So you have a pink box up here. That is the NQ, that is the ES. This is the NQ, and this is Russell. And what's happening is all three markets are breaking out of a range at exactly the same time. And like I said in the first correlation video, when all three markets move at the exact same time, the moves can be powerful. However, what you're going to see me do is I'm going to cut this trade. I'm going to reverse it and go long. So we're going to, we're not going to really take a good look at this sh short. What I want to show you is how I catch a knife and we're going to look into a concept called V flushing. I talk about V flushing and the correlation part one video, and we're going to expand more on V flushing. And then eventually I will have a dedicated video on V flushing and why V flushing is such an important pattern and trigger in my trading. So all three markets are puking at the same time. We're not going to really highlight this short. So I go, the markets are puking hard at this point. So let me actually... So I go, this could be a V flush. I don't know. So basically what a V flush is, is when a range breaks, it'll push out really hard and then come right back in creating a V pattern. And, and what you need, you need a range. So you need some sort of range like this. And what I'm forecasting, what I think may happen is let me draw a picture. Okay. So again, we have we have our ranges. We have our range in ES right here. And then you have your NQ range. So what I'm looking for is a hard push out and a push back in. That would be a V flush. Okay. Now what could happen is when it comes to the rain, when it comes to the bottom of the range, it could fail or it could go all the way through. And what I'm what I plan on doing is taking advantage of this. Now, what you're going to see me do, so I either take advantage of it when it comes back into the into the range, or what I'll do is I'll try to take advantage of it right at the at the bottom. But I don't want to do it at the bottom because I'm essentially catching a knife. The reason I would take it at the bottom is if I have multiple factors of support. What are those multiple factors of support? That would be hitting key pivot points and correlated markets, okay? So that's what determines for me to get in either at the bottom of the V or the top. So, and a V flush must be a pretty clean move down and up. If it starts ranging down here, then it's not a V flush. So let's continue to look at this. So all three are running down. So what I'm doing is making adjustments. So right here, we're, we're breaking in to this zone right here on what looks to be NQ. So this is, this red line is a higher time frame low node. It's a, a key low node on the three year profile you see to the right. But also if I remove myself from the frame here, there's a clear profile here. Okay. And if you want to know how I draw those profiles, I have a video on that. Or what you could do is you could join my uh, coffee prep membership. And there's currently there's 14 hours of 
hard right edge narrated videos, um, 15 sessions. If you like that style of narration, if you want to know what that is, I have these three free videos on exactly what you're getting in the prep membership. And then also you get to see my actual prep prepping uh, on top of that. So you get to see, you get several hours of footage per month. And that library, as the months go on, gets bigger, okay? So your dollar goes and continues to go further as time goes on. So if you want to know how I draw this range here, join the membership section and you can see how I do it. Or you can actually see how I do it in this video as well. That's up to you. So... What I'm looking for is there could be a potential mid pivot here. So I'm I'm drawing out this val this value zone. Okay, so I'm noticing at this point there's a value zone here. And in this narration I go, I think there could be a V flush there. So right here there's a key profile as well. This is a very good profile. Let me actually get rid of myself. So this yellow profile is a very key profile in Russell, okay? Um, is this Russell or is this ES? This actually might be ES. This is ES. So this is a very key uh, profile in ES right here as we're flushing. And notice this very prominent POC. And this prominent POC, instead of being in the middle like it normally is, it's near the high. So this is the volume point of control. For whatever reason, this bell curve put it near the top. So there might be a good chance we pivot the top of this profile. So I get flat right there. So in that short you just saw, I say, I'm going to get flat. So you see me erase it. And then I draw in one that has a value zone. Now, for whatever reason, the POC pivots lower. Okay, but either way, these are prominent nodes. And not only is it a prominent node, but this is the value area high. We're pivoting here um, at the top of this value zone. So now we have two major factors of support. We have this value area high pivot potentially in the ES on a major area. I believe this is a two or three hour range. So this is why it's so important to timestamp um, profiles and I talk more about it in this video. This is a really solid video. I know it's long, but it shows you how I take a chart from nothing and then I draw all my lines and boxes and what they all mean. Okay. So it tells you what the red lines mean, what the white lines, the yellow lines mean. So this is, this is, this is a, a two or three hour, uh, range and we're pivoting it for the first time. So this is EV1, okay? That's a big fucking deal. We're starting to mid uh, This is, uh, is this Russell right here? This just my, this is Russell right here. So what I do is I take this range right here because there seems to be a good value zone above my head, a good range. What does that profile look like? Holy shit, it is mid pivoting that range. And I believe that might be a 30 minute to a one hour range by looking at it. I may or may not put down the line, but judging by the looks of it, it starts at, uh, 10 20 and it ends at 1104. So yeah, it's about a 30 minute range. So that's a pretty good range. And look what's happening right here. What's happening is, well, there's a composite right back here. You can see uh, but also this, this not only is the VPOC in the center of this profile, um, but that curve looks okay. Sure, it has these like volcano tops inside of it. Um, however, the POC is dead center of the curve. And I like it when the POC is dead center of the curve because now this could be a true mid pivot. So I have several things going on right now. So what I have going on is a mid pivot on NQ, okay? And then we're pivoting the top of a major value zone. Oh, and that's a mid a major mid pivot on NQ by the way, on a very high time frame range. We're pivoting the value area high of a very major range on ES, and now we're mid pivoting 
a 30 minute um, range or 30 minute curve on Russell. Sure, that's not super high time frame, and that's not as big of a deal as ES and NQ. However, that that little extra layer of confirmation in Russell, while not some major time frame shit, um, that gives me just a little bit of extra factor of support to start to fade this thing long. Okay. And this looks to me like it could be a V flush at this point. And by the way, if you guys like what I share with you, you can donate as little as $3 to my coffee because I put in a lot of time and effort and at YouTube, this is another job. And those that buy prep membership, you guys are making YouTube worth it because for years I didn't get paid shit for doing this job. And now I'm actually making an income off of doing a second job, which I love doing this. Don't get me wrong. However, it's hard to do this job when it doesn't make money. Now it's making money. And I'm so thankful for those of you who are supporting me. And it, it really gives me the drive to continue to do YouTube videos uh, because I love sharing this shit. I'm pa obviously I've been doing it for years for free and I'm very passionate for it. Um, so as you can see here, now let's continue to sort of, uh, I do need to erase real quick all these old levels. Um, give me a second. All right, so let's start to fast forward. So uh, briefly there, I was long. You, I don't know which frame it was right there at 21.50. I can't pause it because it's so quick. There it is. So we're getting long there because I think it's a V flush. However, it is kind of dicking around right here. I know it's ranging and I said if it's a range, I said if it's a range, it's it's null and void. However, it's not a good enough range. I actually need to get out of frame so you can see the ES. So this is a 30 second chart. So it's not quite a good range. It's not a good enough range. Now these V flushes can dick around slightly near the bottom tip. Okay. Also, there's another factor of support that red line on NQ as well. Not only it's not quite the most midsection of this area, but it's pretty close and it's on the red line, which is the low note of this three year profile you can see right here. So that's really good. So now it's starting to V up in my favor. So I've elected to get into this thing early. And all three markets are moving at exactly the same time. So it did It did kind of drop a little bit. We don't want to panic out of it because sometimes these V flushes can kind of shimmy backwards a little bit. However, it still has that V shape from this perspective. So, so here's the thing. I say I don't know if they're going to pivot the bottom of the ranges. So Russell is starting to breach into its range bottom. So what I want to see it do is cleanly flush all the way through. If it starts to pivot and puke back down, because one of two things can happen right here from this perspective. And Russell is the first of the three markets to sort of hit its range bottom. So these V flushes can puke back down or they can work their way through. And what I want to see it do is just start to work its way up and through. Now, if it's fast or slow, whatever, I just want to see it not puke back. Because the moment it pukes back to the bottom of the V, it is no longer good. Okay? Um, and Russell is the first of the three markets to break into the bottom of its range, essentially. So, Russell could be a leading indicator at this point. So let's continue to play. So you can see, you can see like the trade is clearly working out really well and in our favor. Um, so what I want to, what I'm starting to get ready to do is I'm going to start taking off most of the size uh, near the bottom of the pink box. So ES hits its pink box. Uh, right behind my head right here. So ES hits the bottom of that range. Now I'm just waiting for NQ to drag up to the bottom of its range as well. So I, all three markets at this point have hit the bottom, or ES and Russell have hit the bottom of their ranges. We're waiting for NQ to fucking do it. 
So Russell is burrowing up. Oh. Russell is burrowing up inside. There's no point in seeing what's behind me on ES, or you can kind of see it. Now I'm just waiting for NQ, which is kind of the lagging indicator, to get up in there. Then I'm see now I'm starting to work a scale because I guess there's so much drama. And 25 is a psych price. Psych prices tend to influence shit. So you can see me working most of the size out. We're taking 10 of 12 lots off at that point, and now I'm left with just two. So what I'm trying to do is run two all the way across this range. So I'm screenshotting and sending this to the Discord. Um, so I just screenshot this. I'm play by playing this in the Discord, by the way. There's a link description in the Discord. I simply just chat on occasion. I don't really, I'm either there or I'm not, but there's times where I start talking through trades there in the ES section. So if you do want to see that, feel free to join the Discord. It's absolutely free community that I built. I've been building community since uh, the beginning of 2020. Uh, in January. So if you'd like to join my free community, there's so much resource going on in there. You can learn coding from Frozen Tundra, which he's been on my channel a few times. And then a uh, good friend of mine, Zero uh, Trader, he, um, I've known him probably the longest since my original room back in 2020. Um, he's teaching and sharing a um, different style of trading so if my style of trading is a little too much, people tend to gravitate for, towards him. So that this is a real community uh, that's being built where it's not solely focused on me. Um, it's a place where traders who have different styles can coexist. Anyways, uh, we're all, you know, anyways, let's continue to look at this. So I'm going to fast forward the shit out of this because... Um, there's a lot of drama right here at this point. So, you know, I'm kind of setting up value zones to see what could potentially happen. Let's keep continue to go. So I just skipped by several frames. You can see it's hesitating to get into uh, its ranges, but they are successfully going in. Keep fast forwarding. And I'm trying to find where the Dom is. Okay, so I fast forwarded quite a bit here. Now, as you can see, um, Russell barely right here. It's starting to not quite flush all the way through. It's starting to range quite a bit. ES and NQ are starting to pull back some. So I'm still holding. I'm not sure if I still have two on or one because I do scale a one lot way up here near 28. And then the last one lot pretty much comes back and I get out for a point. However, it's still a good fucking trade. Um, yeah, this is right near the close. So what had happened was we did get up into the 27s and I do scale one right up there because it's right over the POC for the session on the RTH um, and ES. So I do elect to scale a one lot off right up there. And then this final lot is going to come off uh, right down here. So unfortunately, I kind of skipped through the section where it's like, okay, I need to get out of this. However, you know, it was really hesitating and struggling to get up there. And the price action started to really consolidate Russell's starting to go way too sideways at this point, and you're you're just not really getting that bang through I need. Um, and again, I'm typically cutting bulk position off. Um, you know, bef before tar. Plus, there's so much going on in the higher time frame, like that. There's a major support and resistance level up here that I do talk about in this video. That's still in play, in my opinion, and the higher time frame is essentially pushing the market down. Um, now, what is interesting here is there is a red box you can see on ES. Uh, let's go backwards, actually, to where you can just uh, see that. We're at 35, 38. 
So, um, oh, that's right. I scale right because we start to pivot off that white box right there. So, I know this is a little jumbly of a mess right here. I apologize, guys. So, I do pivot. I do start to scale because of us touching the bottom of this white box, which is essentially a value zone or a bell curve in this section. And it's an EV zero. And when it's coming up there, I do mention in the Discord that, you know, I just have a one lot on now because there's very there's very much a high probability this fucking shit comes back. NQ doesn't quite hit that white box. However, the fact that ES did it, it's like, ugh, you know. And also ES is pivoting right here underneath this red line, which is a major support resistant or a major low node, which is now resisting that low node. Arguably, this red box here is the most major support resistance area. However, where, you know, this... You know, we can get a pivot in this white box section that I just pointed out right here. And NQ is kind of doing it too. And typically, typically those things need to get a good pivot. And the amount of chopping and struggling is pretty fierce. And also, when we, when we go forward, let me erase all this shit right here. When we go back to minute marker 35... Um, right here. See the sand color 27? That's the point of control for the entire fucking session. So that's very gravitational. Um, so for me, the fact that we're pivoting the white box and then you have the VPOC right under us with over 22,000 contracts that have traded, for me, that's like, well, shit, that is a very high probability of there's a good chance that this is going to have a hard time going through. And then also Russell is just, it's starting to range and it's not at all getting in the, its range. It, it's not at all getting in its range. Let's see if I have a bigger screenshot of it right here. Russell's should be just cleanly sweeping up through. And there's also a value zone up here as well. <laughs> and now it's all starting to come back to me, guys, why I scaled up there. We get a top tick on this new range right here. You can barely see it, but in the pink box, this is a new range. We're getting a top tick here, and then you can see there's a white box here. This is the official value, zo value zone, which it's a 1.5 hour value zone, and it just tests on its range top tick right here um, for the first time. So you're getting a top tick of a, of a new range. So you're getting two things going on here. You're testing this upper value zone in the circle for the first time. And you're also getting a top tick on a new range that's below it. So a top tick and testing the value zone at the at the same time is kind of like a really solid signal. This might go down. And if I'm not mistaken, ES hits that white box I showed you for the first time as well. Let's go back and just kind of look at it. Because it's kind of, you know, reviewing this shit after the fact. Yeah, so you're getting the first test of uh, ES at the same fucking exact time as well. So um, let me actually double check on my charts real quick. Okay, so now you can see things a, a lot more clearly once I get my fucking head out of the way. Here's that rage. Here's that white box up here. Here's that top tick on Russell. And I have the crosshair tool right here. And to the left is ES. This is where ES would be hitting the white box for the first time. So actually ES and uh, Russell both hit their white box at the same time for the first time. And then also uh, you get that small top tick you can see right here in Russell as well. So that was why I scaled, you know, a, a one lot off near the price of 27 and then i decided to leave the last one on as a hail mary only in case i knew there was a really good chance it could fucking fail but you never know so i wanted to leave it on for a hail mary so at this point i think we could just kind of watch the last contract come out that right there was uh that russell's fucking failing 
Russell's just absolutely failing the V flush. It's done with. It's like over with. That's not good. Um, the markets have desync. They're not quite sunk up. I'm waiting for the last. There's that. There's a. And then here we go. We're going to get the fuck out. On the last lot, right? Oh, there's a bottom tick on um, Russell there. Unfortunately, that went so quick. You can kind of see it right here. So for me, I'm like, I'm going to try to hold it a little longer because we do have a bottom tick. Um, but unfortunately, the fees are flushing in. So now everything's out of sync. Um, NQ's not pulling back nearly as far as our ES. So, And also, this red box is a major zone in the uh, ES. So I'm hoping at this point it could hold. Um, and that the markets will push up, but I do believe I, yeah, we're looking to just get the fuck out of it at this. There you go. So there it was. It was still a good trade. Nevertheless. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed part two of the, why correlations is such a good fucking signal video. Um, correlations again, the sum it up really after seeing as much content as you had on correlations. Um, it is by far the most powerful signal there is. Um, it allows me to be more patient and sit through low, low volatility environments because these markets tend to drag the other markets up. Now, Russell gets a little wacky where it does its own thing. However, that's not to be ignored because when Russell... If the other two markets like NQ and ES are trying to break out and Russell's in a giant range, that can fuck with NQ and ES and cause them to have a harder time of making a clean break versus all three markets breaking at the same time. And I said this in the other video, I'll say it here. I've been hearing good things about Dow Jones. I've not looked at Dow Jones. Um, however, I've been hearing good things about using that as well. In fact... You could probably use all sorts of shit. People are using uh, Fang and Apple, and I've seen correlations work with Apple, although that is a little too much to manage because my my training, trading is very hands-on and it's very labor-intensive. Um, so for me, it's hard to squeeze more markets in. But again, these correlations are so powerful it is better than anything else out there before correlations i started using delta again heavily and i've made a video where i said not nice things about delta and i really started to like cumulative delta quite a bit um however once i discovered the power of correlations by using my high probability setups that i would use in just es and looking for them to align in these other markets it's taken my trading to another level and it's by far more powerful than anything else out there. Um, I'm no longer looking at time and sales anymore because quite frankly, I don't have the room for it. Now I'm looking at three doms and um, also the correlations really do pick up the slack. Now is order flow still important? Absolutely, fucking -lutely. order flow is still imperative and important in my opinion. Um, the reason I used three DOMs, which I want to explain right now is there can be times and in the strike zoning video, I, if you've seen the strike zoning video, if not, you should, because what's happening here pertains to why I use three DOMs. Okay. So oftentimes I'll mark levels on all three DOMs and I'll be looking for these pressure points or potential areas where the markets will puke and run. And oftentimes I'll mark them on the DOMs, which we haven't seen in these recent examples. And um, that way, because I have three screens, a screen down here, which is just the DOMs. And I still use Auction Vista, by the way, for NQ. I have a screen up here for NQES. Actually, what you're seeing is all three screens. This is a screen up here. Down here is the Russell screen. And then we have a third monitor on a different computer because I execute on a different computer with Jigsaw. 
So what you're seeing is an overlay of three different screens. Just having levels marked out on Jigsaw allows my eyes to not have to travel across so much real estate. And it's easy to see the profiles on the profiles where I could start executing ES. And there's times where I'm going to execute ES where I can't take my eyes off the DOMs. However, I like I, there are times where I cannot look away because that split second could really be the difference between a bad trade and a, a break even or a loser. So having the DOMs in my peripherals and seeing all three markets move together really helps because if I'm trying to get long and I see NQ just ripping off the top of my DOM, that's good. And then also I want to know, you know, I'm also still reading the order flow or more so feeling order flow. I don't think you necessarily, like I don't read order flow as much as I feel it. There's a huge difference at some point because I've been looking at the doms for so long, there's a feel to it that I can't really explain. And it's just not the numbers that are coming in. It's the way the market's bouncing. It, does it rip up really quick and then drop in slow and then rip up really quick and drop in slow? That to me tells me things and that's not really necessarily a number thing. And then there's things like slipping. That's very important that you only can really see on a Dom. You could see it on other tools, but it's easier to see on a Dom. And that's a very powerful technique in the art of the trade. I talk about how high of a statistic leveraging a slip in my favor has. It's more of a high volatility type thing. And I'm starting to see more volatility come into the market. So slipping is kind of a valid thing at this point. Whereas when the markets are really low volatility, slipping isn't a big thing. However, in cubing as thin as it is, slips all the time. So we want to leverage slips on NQ if we take an NQ trade. However, like if I can see that Russell, because Russell's on the right, ES in the middle, NQ on the left. If I see like, you know, if I'm really in a trade and locked in, like is Russell pushing up to a point of control? And then I don't have to look at these other screens. And, and then if the markets sweep and there's clearly sweeping on the DOMs, I want to know if it's sweeping on all three markets or if it's not sweeping on all three markets. Are they sweeping one market? Are they sweeping one market, but the other market tries to sweep, but they're just iceberging instead? That's giving me a bunch of contextual queuing as well. And I do want to see where people are putting bigger limit orders as well. And it's just context. It's not to make a stout trading decision. It's just extra information to make a decision. So having all three DOMs and I'm used to it because again, in my how to read a DOM video, if that's when I used to trade just bonds. And back then um, I would trade the 10 year, which was the slowest out of all the markets, you know, as a treasury market. I look at ZB, ZF, TN10, ultra bonds and ES for, inverse correlation. So at one point I was strictly DOM trading and looking at six different DOMs all in one go for months and months. So there's something in that by doing that, that it's, it's just natural for me to look at three DOMs. Like it's, it's like all of a sudden it's like not, it's not that foreign because I've done it in the past. So to conclude this correlation video, I think having three DOMs up is important because again, in the sh strike zoning video, I talk about cone of vision. And instead of looking at three monitors to look at all three markets, I can see what they're all doing in an area that is literally true to size because, you know, these screen shares right here are way too small. The monitors aren't that small. However, this is an accurate representation of how big these DOMs are in real life on my monitor because these three mon these two monitors are shrunk right here where I'm only recording half of a little less than half of a monitor right here whereas behind these uh is the auction vista for NQ auction vista is still important to me um 
and I choose to use NQ because I, I got to do a separate video on Auction Vista. I may never do it. However, Auction Vista is a three second chart, which is arguably the smallest time frame where normally when you're looking at my Sierra charts, I'm only looking at 30 second charts for the most part. So what a lot of you're seeing are 30 second charts. Then I'll go to 10 minutes, then 240, and then daily charts. But I'm mostly in the 30 second time frame. However, the auction Vista for ES, I've always used on like roughly a three second basis. The problem is the volatility has gotten so low that it's really kind of useless and there's no point to going to such a small time frame. Whereas if the volatility is super high, going down time frames is more viable because you're getting these really rapid movements, but those are ranges. And the problem is on a 30 second bar, it could have moved up and down so many times in a very high volatility market. That 30 second bar is not capturing a range on a three second chart that I need to know about that micro range. But that's more of a high volatility type of environment. Whereas we don't have that on a 30 second auction Vista. ES gets stuck in these like two tick, three tick ranges forever that really there's no point in seeing that information in such a low volatility environment. Whereas NQ moves a lot and NQ does put in decent ranges that looking at the auction Vista of NQ to finer tune my entries uh, is really substantial. However, unfortunately, my recordings don't have that auction Vista because for the sake of me doing a review, it's important for me to see these charts more so than the auction Vista. Um, however, order flow is still a big part of all of it. And seeing, like, being able to have all three markets, I'm able to strike zone all these charts on all these different screens on literally less than half of screen real estate. So instead of looking at two screens to look at all of these charts, NQ, ES, and then Russell, right? From here to here, my eyes have to travel pretty far to look at ES and NQ just on the same screen. And then I got to go to another screen to look at Russell. Whereas right here, I mean, literally this DOM, right? All three markets are right here. They're more narrow. They're more compact. So therefore my eye travel doesn't have to go so far. And now I can keep track of all three markets during a critical time of execution where I can't let a trade breathe because there's certain points in time where trade needs to breathe and there's a point in time where trades don't need to breathe and I need to be very quick about it. And during those critical moments, having a very compact view of all the markets is so crucially important. So this is why I run DOM still. Order flow is still important. It's very critical. I still think you guys should do tick drills. Uh, it's such a major aspect to my trading because I've done it for so long. However, correlations in these markets like I've showed you in these two videos really picks up a lot of slack and really gives me these super signals. And this is the evolution of my trading. And when you guys watch my channel from the very first videos to now, you're watching a system. It's the same system, but it's evolving and getting refined as the years and time goes on. And I'm very excited to see where we're, we're going to be in a year from now. Um, because I am getting better at holding and correlations allow me to know when to hold longer and when to cut. In the correlation video, I talk about how I shared a story about how ES was on a high probability move up and it rolled for no reason. It, it rolled because of this like random phenomenon. And then when I looked at Russell, Russell pivoted a key high node. So, um... You know, correlations are so fucking important. I, I would say correlations are extraordinarily important. However, they're only as important as understanding gaps. They're only as important as understanding gap plays, volume profile plays, mean reversion plays, putting it all together. In these videos I just showed you, understanding those principles are why correlations are so important. 
And without understanding these principles and these setups, these are good setups I found in just ES. And I learned that these setups work in other markets and leveraging the other markets and getting them to work together on good setups that I learned in just ES makes correlations good. Uh, because if I was just to trade correlations just based off movement, it doesn't work. And I made a video some time ago how I didn't like correlations. And now things have totally changed because it's not correlations. It's the setups. It's correlated high probability setups setting up at the exact same time. They don't need to be the same setups. They don't all need to be V flushes happening at the same time. Hell, in the example I just showed you, ES and NQ could be V flushing where uh, Russell might be compressing against a gap. And that compression on a gap says, hey, all three markets might go up at the same time. So it doesn't need to be the exact same setups across all three markets. It needs to be setups of good probabilities that agree on direction, but they can be different setups across all three markets. That's when correlations work and make sense. I hope you guys enjoyed this correlation series. If you would like, consider donating as little as $3 to my coffee to support the work I do on YouTube because ultimately your support is what makes doing YouTube worth it. And we'll see you guys in the next video.